So welcome everybody to the colloquium uh, with the two of the great brains of our time in science. And uh, let me introduce you, Dr. Barry Barish. <laughs> I, I don't think I pronounced it right, but uh, he, <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, he's a Nobel awardee of uh, 2017, and he's gonna talk about his, uh, his research. He will do it much better than me. And also mm, our uh, uh, main um, protagonist also is Dr. Aaron Chekanovich, almost. <laughs> he's, uh, he's a, a medical doctor but works in the uh, in the chemistry field and and one is working now in uh, in the US is from the US from is working in California in the Caltech Institute and Dr. Chikanovich is in in Haifa in Technion Institute so they they are going to introduce themselves that gave me the, the the great pleasure of doing it themselves and and then we will start with a series of questions. We will go from the more personal experiences in science to the more uh, specific aspects of our profession. All of us in here are, are scientists of different areas. And we will, we will have an opportunity to, to ask them and to, to get to know what people like them in the top of their careers know about, about the science right now. So please. Dr. Barbarish. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm, uh, I was born in the US. Uh, I grew up in, uh, my, can I be heard? It's okay. I, I grew up in uh, an area right adjacent to Hollywood, California. So that's influenced my life. I grew up as a small kid with uh, movie people and writers and actors and so forth and children of that. So in my life from a very early age, I think uh, imagination was a big part of kind of my orientation and still is. And I, I think uh, imagination in science is a, is a really important concept and has been in, for, for myself. I thought because I grew up in Hollywood, California, I would write, be a writer of some sort. I didn't think I'd be an actor. Uh, but I thought I'd be a writer. I, I was the editor of a school newspaper, and I, I read and I wrote a lot and so forth. Uh, but eventually, I got I was interested in mathematics and, and science, and uh, decided to study engineering. So I went to the University of California uh, to study engineering. But engineering, although I, I, I use a lot of engineering in my work, is uh, very applied. And I'm more concerned about imagination. And so I changed to physics, which is kind of un trying to understand what we don't know about the physical world. And uh, I, my whole education was in California, in the public university, uh, Berkeley. And then I went to uh, Caltech, where I am now, which is a small private science university. And uh, as a postdoc, and I'm, that's my only job, so that's the end. Uh, I uh, have done a variety of physics, which I would call basic science, answering the most fundamental questions we kind of have. Uh, I've worked on big particle accelerators, designed particle accelerators, uh, worked on exotic particles, neutrinos, uh, uh, magnetic monopoles, and uh, I'm best known for my more recent work, which is on gravity, and uh, seeing after 100 years, or detecting after 100 years, uh, something called gravitational waves that were predicted by Einstein, uh, and we saw it 100 years later. So. Thank you very much. Really, really um, ample information about your, your development as a scientist, and what about you, Dr. Aaron? So, uh, my name is Aaron Chikanover. I'm an Israeli scientist, born and raised in Israel, spent some years in the United States, but I'll tell you about it. Um, so in Israel, you know, at the age of 18, people have to go to the military, but the military lets some people study first and then come and serve in their profession. It's a very smart system. So I went to study medicine in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And after graduation, I went to the military and became a combat physician. 
unfortunately also with the combat experience because it was exactly the war of 1973, which was a big war in the area. We have wars in cycles all the time with our nice neighbors, but this was a big one. So finishing my military, completing my military service, I trained in surgery, so I'm a surgeon by training. But then I decided that I don't want to practice medicine and I left the hospital. And I went back to the university and did my PhD. And during the PhD, along with Avram Hirschko, my mentor who is also here, uh, we discovered a very important system that is called the ubiquitin system. It's a system that clarifies the body from faulty proteins. The proteins, as you know, are very big, long structures. They are folded in the three-dimensional, uh, way uh, several types of folding, and they are extremely sensitive to heat, to mutation, to irradiation, and uh, therefore they are getting uh, rotten all the time, they are getting damaged, misfolded all the time, and we have to move them, to remove them, not to move them, to remove them. And one way, of course, is to cut them into pieces, to amino acid, and then to reutilize the amino acid, but the process has to be very specific because there were already, when we entered the field in the 70s, there were already known systems for degrading proteins, like the lysosome, which is an intracellular organelle, but it is acting in a non-specific way. They digest everything, like the stomach. Here, we were looking for a specific system, because if you have, let's say, 1,000 molecules in the cell of the same type, but only one is misfolded, you need to pick up the one take it away, but leave all the other 999 intact. So this was a, a kind of a, a very cumbersome task for proteases to do because proteases are in nature non-discriminatory. I will not go into the details of the discovery, but at the end of the day, uh, we did the biochemistry, but once the human genome was exposed in 2000, the first human genome, it turned out that the system that we discovered contains 2,000 proteins, the system. So it's about almost 10% of the human genome. It's the biggest system, biggest family in the database. So we discovered the principles of the system and how it works. And then it was time to go away for a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, and I went to MIT, to Boston, to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I spent five years at MIT. It was a very successful period. I expanded my knowledge in cell biology, but also continued to work um, on the ubiquitin system and finishing, completing my postdoctoral fellowship after some deliberations whether to stay in the United States or to go back, I decided to go back. And I've been in the Technion in my mother, Alma Mater Institute ever since. I have a very big laboratory. We have a company, we're developing drugs for cancer at different stages and um, I'm in the Technion. So that's briefly my story. Leading us into into my question because you have uh, you have explained what's the the top point of your careers is has been the development that led to the Nobel Prizes and you have continued working obviously but I want to know because I, I have told you that I'm right now I'm the director of the School of Doctorate I want to go back to when you started when you were PhD candidates. How, how were you as PhD candidates? What motivated you to, to start in, in science? And how, what style of, of uh, student were you? <laughs> uh, do you want me to go first? Uh, I think I was driven by one word, not imagination that I used before, but curiosity. It's something since I was young. And uh, basically uh, <coughs> what drove me to study physics, was my interest in imagination and so forth. But what drove my research was curiosity about questions that we had in physics that weren't answered. And uh, at, at the time I worked on my PhD, what I thought was the most, for me at least, the most exciting area was the discovery of the fundamental particles that make up nature. And those were being discovered because uh, big instruments were being made that enabled us to do that, big particle accelerators. So I went to work uh, doing research both on developing new particle accelerators and using them to 
study the elementary particles. So that's kind of what, mm -hmm. what I did as a graduate student and pretty much for my, much of my early career. Mm -hmm. yeah, for me, the beginning was a, a little bit because I really wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a physician. So that's what I, I, I studied and, and trained. But then I realized that in medicine, I don't know how many of you are physicians or are doing medicine. No physicians, but, but typically, typically when patients are coming to the hospital, basically in all chronic diseases, it's too late. You know, the disease is well advanced. You know, if you are thinking about heart attack, you know, people are suffering from heart attack. It started 30, 40, 50 years ago when cholesterol started to accumulate in the coronary arteries. And then what is heart attack? It's complete occlusion of the arteries. So, but the process started. If you are seeing a patient with Parkinson, he already lost 80% of the function. So Parkinson start of the, you know, of the substantia nigra par compacta, this area in the brain that is responsible for, for stability. If you are coming with cancer, you know, for many cancer, it's too late. Pancreas, ovarian, esophagus, stomach, brain, too late. And I wanted, naively, I must admit, to understand the uh, how it starts, why people become sick. Um, it was very naive, I must admit, uh, very naive. Um, so we started to work on protein degradation. This was, uh, and I didn't know how this is at the end going to connect at all to medicine. We didn't, you know, when, when I started my PhD, I said, wow, this is a big disappointment. I came here to do, to understand basic medicine and we are dealing with degradation of proteins. What's the connection? But as you all know, in, in science you need a lot of patience. It's coming at the end, you know, but it takes years. So we discovered just the basic. We had no clue about uh, medicine. But then, after 10 years, people said, okay, if proteins must be degraded, what happens if they are not properly degraded? Especially proteins that are related to diseases, like oncogenes and aggregated proteins in the brain. So then they saw that the system is involved in diseases. Then pharma company came in, and drugs started to come. But the, the whole process took a long time. And at the end, I found myself back in medicine from the back door, but now looking at it from a little bit broader view than the physician's view, which is always a single patient. The physician, every moment, sees a single patient. Uh, but you know, yeah, now I'm looking at it from the drug point of view, drug development from the uh, big industry from mechanisms of disease. So it's a different view of medicine. But uh, as I said, you know it as good as I am that it's a long way. It's a long way. Okay. So this was the... The beginning <laughs> of your interest. So you both came from uh, uh, wanting to solve some uh, a specific question into, uh, in, into a broad area that was needed to be, to be applied. So you both were driven by, by the theme that you wanted to do, more than doing research, being researchers. Did you see yourselves as researchers or you wanted to understand and you didn't know exactly what was the role of a, of a researcher? <laughs> just what you said for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never defined myself. It, it, I just knew what I wanted to do. Because I think that now we have, a, we have that role more institutionalized than, than probably when you, you started. So I, I don't know how was you, for you, do you see as uh, being in the role as, as the, the, the one that is near Hollywood, being in the role? <laughs> well, I always saw myself as a, just as a physicist and mm -hmm. I did whatever it uh, required to answer the questions I was interested in, whether it was develop new technologies mm -hmm. or uh, solve problems. Or right now I'm interested in using something that's developed outside but isn't used very much to solve physics problems right now, which is machine learning and mm -hmm. uh, AE and seeing uh, what physics problems that we couldn't solve before we might be able to solve using tools that are built for another mm -hmm. purpose. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and for, your, for you, I guess it was more like a attaching, uh, doing research in something that can be applied to solve already problems that were long. In, in I never thought, I think that, 
you know, typically in universities, especially nowadays, they try to push you to applied science. People, you know, they have even term, translation, apply, something. And I think that this is the wrong approach. I think that scientists should go after their gut feeling. <laughs> and uh, I push it away. You know, if, if something comes, it comes. Because I think that, you know, in the word applied and in the word translation, it means that you apply basic into useful or marketable or product or whatever. Also translation, what is translation? We take one language and we translate it to another language. So you translate basic science into, I don't think that the two sciences are separated from one another. I think that uh, at the end, when people tell me what you are studying and is it useful, I say, I don't know whether it's useful. It's of interest for me and I do what I want to do. And uh, I don't make a distinction between basic and applied science. I make a translation between good science and bad science. And, and, and I think that that's all the story. And, I, and, and good science can be, you know, what Barry did, you know, understanding the world. You know, it doesn't have to make drugs and we don't have to make clean energy, you know, just to understand the world where we are. You know, gravitational waves or, or expansion of the universe or, or the Big Bang, how, how it started at all. I don't think that, I think that's, that science should be limited to anything that, that, that you know, we, you can buy tomorrow in the pharmacy or in the grocery store. Uh, I think that the drive should be curiosity. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I think that our students, our PhD candidates have a question for you. Uh, so. Yes, so uh, <laughs> thanks for, your, uh, for sharing your experience. Uh, Christian, levantate. Yeah, so thank, thanks first for being here and sharing your experiences. Very valuable for us. Um, and actually, uh, I would like to know what were your references when you were like PhD? Like, what were you, like you were thinking perhaps in someone like were shaping your 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 idea of follow? I don't know. Perhaps in your case, like transitioning between engineer into physics or or just going into the army, into the academia. So what were you thinking at that moment? And so the, 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 do you have any benchmark at that moment? Or well, what were your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Uh, who are you first? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm Christian. I'm doing a PhD here in, in Uji. Uh, so I am the last year of my PhD. Uh, so I'm very curious about my, my question is because uh, in my case, I'm doing things related with economics, but I think like thinking about what is good science or bad science, how can I make my research more uh, scalable into things that perhaps can, could impact like what society is requiring right now, like what, what, what is really needed. So in that case, now we have technology, we have AI, we have uh, things that we can, for example, put it into the medicine. How can we do the identification of diseases better? So in this case, like, how can I use this knowledge that I have from some field and put it into other fields? In your case, like, you try to translate, like, to move on. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, when I was a, a student, uh, maybe starting as an undergraduate, I, I said I started I think I said I started as an engineering student and then became a physics student. And as an undergraduate in physics uh, in Berkeley, they had particle accelerators, which I mentioned I, I worked on later. And uh, the professor that was the reason I switched to physics and was my advisor uh, worked on these particle accelerators. And so uh, he, uh, I was a pretty good student, so he said I could do some research while I was an undergraduate in Berkeley. And uh, I, uh, the, if any of you have ever been in Berkeley, there's a big laboratory up on the hill behind the campus. And when I was a student, it was a pretty significant walk, like 40 minutes up from the campus to the laboratory. And my professor, who I was as a tiny undergraduate trying to work for, was always often too busy for me. So I went around the laboratory because I, it was too much work to just go up there and come back down and uh, learned about a lot of the technology, in this case, particle accelerators. And 
basically, what I did is something that I even mentioned now is what I do, and which is I have tried to understand what are the fundamental things we'd like to do. In my case, it's basic information, but want to do. And what's limited us in knowing that now? And what new tools might be able to make you solve the problems or move to the next step? In this case, uh, for me, it was particle accelerators. And as a student, learning what we didn't know, that you might use the new particle accelerators to uh, be able to solve in physics and use the particle accelerators to give us information. Today, it's right now, it's that people have developed machine learning, as I said, and I'm trying to see where I can apply that to some physics problems, which we haven't really made as much progress as we might, where there's a lot of data, but we don't really know how to use it, and maybe using uh, machine learning can help. I haven't solved that problem, but the approach is the same, which is a little bit like you're saying. You can learn what the problems are and which developments can be applied to make, you don't have to invent everything yourself, what developments might be helpful to move it in a direction that you'd like. And that's what I've done, pretty much. So I guess you were a very motivated student if you had to go up the hill. <laughs> yeah, I was motivated. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I study. <laughs> People do an effort to engage in things that motivate them. And, and what about you, Aaron? Well, uh, my entry into science was very different. I, I didn't climb any stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because there were no stairs, you know, in the in surgery, it's a very strange profession in medicine. It's very manual, um, and a lot of blood, and, and there is no, there, there was a, the research base is very, I wouldn't say weak, but surgeons are not really there. Um, so I had to start from the beginning. I really didn't know what is a pH. We learned basic chemistry, and I was a medical student. I started from scratch, you know, really like a, like a beginning undergrad when I started my PhD. So I took a few months to study basic biology for myself, took a few courses just to understand the language. I came from, from a very different world. But also the choice of the mentor was very difficult because again, I didn't have a clue. And I never did any science before. I didn't know what is science, except for what you study in medical school. And medical school always reminds me Spanish meals, like it's a tapas meal. You know, it's a little of this and little of this, little physiology, little biochemistry, little of everything. There is nothing really solid about it. You just, you know, you just taste a little bit. And um, so I had to do, the first years were rather difficult because I had to educate myself. And also to choose the mentor, I didn't know, you know, he told me protein degradation. What is it at all? I didn't know, I, you know, I had no clue. But the thing that I liked about Avram, he was very young at the time. He just came himself from a postdoctoral fellowship. I was his second student. We came together, two students, and it was a very young lab. And um, he told me that there is a problem. He doesn't, he's not sure even that it exists. So he, he thinks about the system, but he doesn't know that it even exists. And it might be you know, that we'll waste our time. He will waste his time, I will waste my time, because there was no hint at all. For this. There were some basic assumptions, and I liked it because it looked to me like an adventure, so I asked him, Let, for the first year or two, I'll do half surgery, half biochemistry. Very mixed salad, you know, surgery and biochemistry. And he agreed, so I came to the lab in the nights and weekends and days off and, and so on, and it took about two years until we found a clue, and then I decided uh, uh, to leave surgery altogether. And at that time, I felt also confident that, that we have something. Now, technologies are changing rapidly in biology, extremely rapidly. I mean, the lab was revolutionized numerous times because we started with chemistry, with biochemistry, just pure protein, you know, biology. Then we moved to molecular biology, so now we make our proteins ourselves by expression of DNA, and of course we mutate them, we modify, we modify them. Then we move to animal models, because now we are doing mouse genetics, and all in a, in a relatively short time. And, uh, and now we are also generating our own mice, so with diseases and... So, uh, 
I believe that this will be my last revolution now. <laughs> it's, uh, it takes time to change the whole lab and to train the people and to bring. But biology is really moving extremely fast. I think that if you think of it philosophically, I don't know about physics. Of course, there are numerous um, open questions in physics and in chemistry that people are working. But I think that time has ripened that those questions will be applied to biology and to medicine because there are so many open questions in biology. The brain, for example. We understand nothing. I'm not a cancer, I think, is on the way to be solved one way, but, but neurodegenerative diseases, we are far from understanding memory and you know high functions of the brain. And drug development is changing rapidly with AI now um, um, coming in, helping a lot. So biology is really changing in a, in a big, big way. Um, and uh, so I have gone through several major changes in my life. Uh, we are now introducing, of course, AI, screening of pathological slices. So the pathologist, uh, to help the pathologist in diagnosis and in mostly in prognosis, in knowing whether the patient will relapse or will not relapse. But uh, yeah, we are being aided by very sophisticated technologies and I don't know whether I will go for another one. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. So I see that you have been, um, you have had very different type of mentors at your beginning. So one much more engaged, probably in your case, much more uh, attached to the bench, and another one a little bit farther away, but uh, having a group that does the, the work for you. So, and how do you think you are as mentors, as supervisor? What's your style? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my style is just like we were very different. I almost, I officially had no mentor. Uh, the chairman of our physics department signed my card. Okay. As I had worked on particle accelerators, it's because I went to the laboratory. I figured out a, uh, a project to do. It, I got published. It was good enough for a thesis. So they had the problem of having me have an advisor. So the department chairman signed it. So I'm very passive. My, my best, my uh, personal uh, attitude about being a mentor is to be accessible, uh, not to be directive. So for me, I want to be accessible. I want to know what they're doing, uh, not be judgmental, but be, know what they're doing, be involved in what they're doing, be rather minimal in making suggestions because it should be their work, but be... Uh, yeah be accessible. It's hard to be accessible because people feel you're more important or something, but that's the challenge. And for me, it's the most important attribute in my style is to be accessible to the students. I think that mentorship changes uh, with years as the mentor or the PI matures. I think that at the beginning, you are concerned about your promotion, you're concerned about your grants, so you, you look at the students more like, let's try to say gently, it's good hands that help you. Because you, have, you are yourself, have to establish yourself. You know, you are non-tenured, you're just an assistant professor, you just started. But as you mature, of course you change. And what I do now, I give them complete independence. So we always work on ubiquitin system, so that's the system that we discover. We never go to something else. We always work on something that is related to medicine because that's what I like to do. But then I come with an idea and I let them think about it. If they come with an idea, they can think about it. And the lab is made of groups. So every group is working on, on different aspects of the same problem. So the senior, either the senior postdoc or the lab managers who are very well trained are guiding the incoming, the newly incoming students initially until they gain independence. And then I sit with them whenever they want. My door is always open. We have group meeting every week. So every week somebody presents what they go to the other people and to me. If they have a question, they can always come. Of course, I'm in charge of the grants. I bring all the money, uh, all the connections that, that, that we have to make in order to attain tools, you know, that appropriate mice and, and so on and so forth. But basically, I let them go. And I learned it at MIT. I was with a very famous uh, cell biologist with Harvey Odish. I don't know if you know him. He's the one that wrote that 
basic textbook of cell biology. There are two textbooks of cell biology that are stud studied all over the world. One of them is of Harvey. And uh, he always told me that uh, university is not a social organization. You know, it's not a kind of a charity. Science is not charity. People should float. And those that cannot float, drown. And, and, and if you can help them a little bit, okay. If not, you let them drown. So I remember we were like 30 postdocs in the lab. It was a huge, monstrous lab. And, um, and five of them did okay, which was sufficient to get all the NIH grant. And the others somehow drowned. And, and I, I looked at him and I said, Harvey, don't you care about these people? He said, no, I don't. So <laughs> it's their problem, not mine. Well, this is a very kind of an extreme attitude. In Israel, we are a little bit more warmer and so on, so I try to take care, but some people just, they cannot make it. They, they don't go to, they don't re, they, they cannot make it, so, you know. So I try to pull out those that are independent and are excited about it and so on, and, and let them go. At the beginning, I was really mentoring every one of them, I, because I wanted data, I wanted results, because I wanted to promote myself. But now I, I care much less, and, um, and it's funnier now, because I devote less time to it, and also you work basically in the, in the lab, there is a group of those that are running very fast, and it's fun to work with them because they're extremely talented. So you don't have to nurture, like in a kindergarten, the kids that cannot make it. So it's a little bit funnier now. Have the, the nice version of swim or sink, <laughs> but <laughs> a nice uh, rescue. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we have another question from from the PhD candidates that are very much interested in <laughs> your style. So Sonia, yes, it's on. It's on. Okay, so thank you. My question, I'm Sonia, a PhD candidate in the engineering field. You have told us that you work um, several people together, I guess. Um, my question is, how has the role of woman changed since you, since you started your, your research? Thank you. The role of women. It, it, fortunately, it's improved, but it isn't where it should be. Uh, uh, which probably we would all agree, that's a simple, simple statement. But uh, uh, when I started, I talked about going up to the radiation laboratory in Berkeley. Uh, the only women I saw, it was mostly men, were scanning pictures because they would take pictures of particles going through something called bubble chambers. And uh, young women who should be doing something more creative were used to just follow these tracks and make numbers because they didn't know how to use it as computers. On, on my experiment, which is called LIGO, we've had, during the time we discovered uh, gravitational waves, the leader of the collaboration, we have a collaboration that's worldwide, was a woman. Uh, the leader of the technical group that worried about the lasers, the first word in our uh, instrument, uh, was a woman who's now a dean at, UC, at uh, MIT. So we've had, but we don't have as many, that sounds good, but still the dominant uh, gender of the collaboration that we have, a big collaboration, is 85% men, maybe something like that, 15% women. But the women that we have inside the collaboration are, uh, I think, uh, reasonably, distributed over the importance of their roles they play. But we have too few women going into science. It's a very difficult problem because in the US, the uh, problem starts at a much younger age that we uh, don't uh, bring women into science because we discourage them at a younger age. And uh, so as much as we might do later, we can do well, which I think we do in our particular experiment with the women who happen to get that far and make at least their lives equal. Uh, the number of, of women going into science in the U.S. In physics, the number of the fraction of PhDs in, in physics is less than 20% women. It's, I think it's 18% a year ago. I, I happen to know all these numbers. So uh, that's 
not the same as the fact that half the population is women, so we're not using our population. In the US, we also have a problem that we don't have minorities doing during uh, physics either. So we're not doing very well with gender or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, recognizing the problem is the, the way to start. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there is a, still a lot of uh, work to be done. And what do you think in your field? Yeah, it's a, it's a, bit it's a very good question. Let me expand a little bit on that because it's a very sensitive issue. And we should really uh, kind of distinct between real problems and imaginary problems and so on. So let me tell you about medical schools, in Israel at least. I don't know how it is in Spain. When I started medicine, women were less than 10%. Now they are 60%. So people are satisfied. They say, wow, wonderful, 60%. But this is an illusion. It's illusion because men walked out of medicine. And, and women came in. It's not something that came to the understanding that we need to have more women in medicine. It's because medicine in Israel is a low-paying profession. In order to make money, you have to be, you know, a top professor in surgery or so on, but the average is low paying. And, and students moved into computer sciences, dot com, you know, electric engineering, robotics, uh, space, and so on, it's because Israel is a very high tech country. So the people, the males moved into this and left all the, you know, so this is an illusion. You know, people are happy with it. And women in medicine are getting to the top echelons. My wife, until she retired, was a department chairman of internal medicine and geriatrics. So she was running 30 physicians, a big department of 60 beds, and so on and so forth. But again, I was, not imp I was impressed with her, but I was not impressed with the fact that she made it, because it was vacant. I mean, that, that's it. There was space for that. So it was not something that society worked on purposefully to allow it to happen. That's at least in Israel. In, the inst in my university, women are still behind because it's a very technological university. So if you see in the graduate student population, there are about 50%. But once you are coming to the full professors, there are 15. They go from 50 to 15. Why? I cannot tell you. It's, it's very difficult, but at least I can tell you that it's on the table all the time. We always look at it and whether there should be a woman in and why in the committee there are no women. When I talk to my wife about it, she tells me that women are, you know, they want to be more at home, they are, feel more responsible for the kids, for all kinds of things. I, I, I don't know whether this is the explanation, but, the, but we are increasing in the institute. We are doing okay, but it's slow. I must admit that it's slow. On the other hand, we are very much concerned on opposite discrimination. So we shall take women that do not fit and put them in just in order to satisfy, you know, equality. So this is uh, called e opposite equal opportunity. You know, you are, you, are, you are doing something that shouldn't be done in academic life just in order to satisfy some needs or the government or women organization and so on. By the way, in the Nobel Prizes, it's even worse. And they take it very seriously. Every year it's coming up. I remember the Nobel, when I got the Nobel Prize almost 19 years ago, this issue was the issue that was discussed by the chairman of the Nobel Committee. And there are always, you know, chemistry changed a little bit, but I think that out of 150 or so, about six or seven are women, 5%, 5%. So recent years it was kind of better with Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier for for gene editing, for CRISPR, with Ada Yonat, my friend from Israel on the ribosome, uh, with, uh, in physics also, this woman from Canada, I think, yeah, Donna Strickland. So there is a little bit of change, clearly not enough, clearly not enough. What the Nobel people are saying, and they have special meetings on it, they are very much concerned about it. They say that it will come because in order to get the Nobel Prize, typically you have to wait 30, 40 years until the discovery will mature enough. So they say we are now giving the prize for women that worked 20, 30 years ago, and, and in years it will improve when the women of this current generation will enter into the competition. We have to be on guard. All what I'm telling you that the problem is not solved. And we do have to be on guard 
in order to secure that there will be no discrimination. Another issue that is coming up all the time is sexual harassment. Women are harassed. They are bullied, they are whatever. And we should be very careful about this. The very severe measures should be taken against people that do it. I mean, this is, women don't feel safe in, in, in work, even in academia, in the working environment. In my lab, you know, I repeat it all the time. I tell to, to the people in the lab, you don't talk about the new hairstyle, you don't talk about the shoes, you don't talk about anything. You talk only about science. I want the woman to come at midnight to do experiment and to feel completely safe and free. Nothing that will bother them even with a, like a dust of a sand. Nothing. So we do have to be on guard. The problem is far from being solved, but we do see improvement, I must admit. Some of it is artificial, some of it is real. Okay, so we need to plant the seed in order to see that change in the future with the generations, but as you say, we need to be, to understand the problem right now, <laughs> to see what's, what is making it not happen or why it's so slow, no? So I, I agree. So, Just in academic institution, the salaries are the same. I believe that in Spain is the same. So an associate professor, whether a woman, woman at the same rank, get the same salary. That's, that's basic in public organizations. So the, at least that, this was also not, also not the case in the past, but at least now I think that it's straightened out. Yeah, in general, we have the same uh, problem and situation in here, like in the... So now let me introduce Florent. Florent is a biochemist and he's gonna be in charge of more specific questions for you about your topics and stuff. Thank so you. Florent. So it's a pleasure having you here. Um, I'm biochemist, but actually I work as an organic chemist um, making molecules like uh, inhibitors of proteases, of proteasome. So I'm very much interested on, on your field. I'm supposed to make uh, specialized questions. I'll try to do my best here. <laughs> so uh, regarding to, um, to your discover, so uh, basically through the ubiquitination, you became, a, we say, you open a new field of the proteolysis, right? So people like me working on that field, uh, I, I would like to ask you, how do you see the, the new future or which would be, uh, what should we do in order to discover new things on that field? In the ubiquity field? Yeah, uh, or proteasome. Okay. Or proteasome uh, related to lysosome cathepsins, all the proteolysis um, field. So this is a very special, specific question. So let me try to explain you the question. <laughs> no, 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 not that he, not that the question was not clear, but to bring it to the appropriate level. It's okay? Yeah. Okay, just to bring it to the appropriate level, because not everybody speaks. It's a language, you know, it's a jargon that people are using. So what is it? The system that we discovered is basically working in two steps. Because proteases, the enzyme that really cut proteins, if you eat the best uh, the paella, you know, yesterday we had a paella, was not so good, was okay. <laughs> was just okay. Was a little bit salty and too much cooked, but... Uh, but uh, so the proteins are going into the, into the stomach and degraded. So this is non-discriminatory. Every protein that go into the stomach will be degraded. This is not the system that we discovered. As I said, we discovered a system that can remove only damaged proteins. It's a quality control. So let's say that you are in, in Detroit, in a car factory, and the, car, and the cars are coming out of the line, and there is a special, uh, I don't know, infrared light that checks all the, all the features, and a car that has a defect is going out. Out of 10,000 cars, one is pulled out for whatever. It will not go to the franchise for selling. So our system is the same. It can see all the proteins, and decide which one to destroy. But the thing must be before destruction. So the thing is the problem in the system, not the destruction, because once you destroy a protein, it's destroyed. If you take a protein, you know, proteins are made on, on DNA and RNA bit by bit by bit by bit, one amino acid to another, to another, to another. But if you take a protein and you cut it into two, one cut, it's done. You cannot glue it. You have to go back all the way to cut it to all the beads and put it back into the machine again. So it's irreversible. So you cannot, you have to, to check 
the protein that should be cut. And how you check it? By a whole army. There is a whole army, almost 1,000 enzymes that are policemen. They look around and they identify and pull it out. And then what you said, then they mark the protein with ubiquitin. They attach to it another protein called ubiquitin, which mark it for the scissors to come. So the scissors will not cut anything until another protein, ubiquitin, is attached to the victim. I always compare it to swimming in the ocean with sharks. People say, I didn't try it, and I don't want to try it, <laughs> that the sharks will jump on you only if you are bleeding, that they are attracted to blood. If you're not attracted to blood, you can swim side by side. This is an experiment that I recommend everybody not to do. <laughs> but, 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 but nevertheless, so there is a shark in the cell called the proteasome, but the shark will not touch anything. At least in the cell, it's correct. I don't know how it's in the ocean. Um, the, sh the shark will not, unless you have ubiquitin on you. Once you have ubiquitin on you, you are dead. It's like the, the, like the death row in, the, in Huntsville prison in Texas. You know, once you are getting the orange coat, probably you are on your way to, to get executed. So it's a sign. You know, the, the, the Nobel Committee called this protein ubiquitin the kiss of death. So the protein kisses the, pro the, the, the other protein for, for death. So this is the basics. So now there are two types of drugs in principle. And I will talk about very briefly on the two of them. One of them is the future, which you ask, and one of them is the present. One of them are inhibitors of the scissors. So the scissors don't work. So what you are doing, you are accumulating the cell's proteins that are damaged. And you are accumulating them in such a way that they kill the cell, the damage kill the cell. But then you say, so how don't you kill healthy cells? Because you are, you are giving what we call a proteasome inhibitor. For those of you who are not in medicine, there is one disease that was the first disease. It's called multiple myeloma. It's a leukemia of B cells. It's a leukemia of the immune system that we inhibit the proteasome and the cells die. Why they die? Because they accumulate protein. Why the healthy cells don't die? Because we don't inhibit the enzymes all the way. So the, the malignant cells are much more sensitive even to partial inhibition, like 50% or 60% than the healthy cells. You know, we can live with one eye, right? We can live with one kidney. We can live with one leg. So we have normal cells have the reserve. They don't need the full, but the, the malignant cells do need the full cohort of the system. And if we take it half, they die while the other don't die. So this is one set of drugs. But the next one is very interesting, and that's the future. And the whole world is working on it. All the big pharma, all of them, and the first drug probably will be in the market very soon. If you think about two diseases, the big killers, cancer and neurodegeneration, let's put heart on the side for a minute. Cancer is being caused by oncoproteins, right? Oncogenes. Onco, oncos. It's in Greek, tumor. Gene, gene, or protein, protein. So there are proteins that are mutated somehow, and they drive the malignant process. Or genes that are mutated, that code for oncoprotein, that drive the, the malignant process. Like RAS, like MIC, like June, like P mutated P53, like RB, whatever. There are many of them. Those proteins should be recognized by the ubiquitin system and degrade them, because it's a quality control. If you have a mutated protein, but somehow the system does not see them, and they flourish, and they cause cancer. Same in the brain, in all brain diseases, with no exception. Alzheimer, Parkinson, ALS, Huntington, there is always a protein, a pathologic protein, that accumulates and aggregates and causes damage. The only difference between the two, the, all the diseases is the type of the protein and the location in the brain. But otherwise, they all have a common denominator an aggregated, accumulated protein. In Huntington, it's Huntington. In Alzheimer's, it's, it's tau. In Parkinson, it can be Parkin or alpha-synuclein. In ALS, it's SOD1. Doesn't matter. In OTDP43, 
there is a common denominator for all brain diseases, accumulated aggregated protein. Again, the system should know about it, but somehow it doesn't recognize it. So the next generation of drugs are matchmakers, what we call molecular glue. We glue the protein, we bring it into the system and force it into the blender. How do we do it? We are developing, that's chemistry now. It's called PROTAX, proteolysis targeting chimera. We develop small molecules. It's all now, now we are moving to chemistry. So we are developing a molecule that has two heads with a bridge in between. One head binds to the ubiquitin system, to the policeman that recognize it. But the policeman will not recognize the protein unless we bring the thief into the close proximity. The other head binds to the target, to the aggregated protein, to the oncoprotein. Once they come together, because the molecule is small, the chemical is small, and it can take two big proteins and bring them together, then the protein gets ubiquitinated, it gets marked by ubiquitin, and then shredded. So this is, in pharmacology, the, the profession of developing drugs, most of the drugs that you are looking at are inhibitors, are antagonists. Here we are developing an agonist, a, a positive one. Think about pharmacology. If you have high blood pressure, you put an inhibitor to lower the blood pressure. If you have a tumor, you take a kinase inhibitor to stop the, the action of the oxygen. If you open a textbook of uh, pharmacology, you will see that 90% of the drugs are inhibitors. In this case, we are developing an accelerator. We are pushing, we are not inhibiting the system. On the contrary, we push it by bringing the substrate together to degrade the protein and to remove it. It looks successful from some drugs that are already advanced in the pipeline. The first one will be in the market for prostate cancer that will degrade androgen receptor. You know, one of the drivers of prostate cancer is the, uh, the male hormone, testosterone, which is binding to the androgen receptor. So if we kill the androgen receptor, testosterone, has nothing to do. It cannot bind to anything. So there is a, a product that will degrade the androgen receptor, and by that will stop the malignant process. We call this whole field, so within the ubiquitin field, there is a new upcoming field, which is called TPD, targeted protein degradation. We are targeted protein to degradation by pushing it, by gluing it into the system. So there is no doubt that this is going to be the big future of the system. So now it's Barry's, uh, <laughs> not, 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 not to talk on proteins, to talk on something else. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I will be asking you many questions, but <laughs> now it's Barry's. Uh, so uh, for Barry's, I'm not a specialist. Uh, I've been talking with physicists before coming here. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, okay, so with a LIGO experiment, let's say you have uh, a new way to discover mm, new regions of the universe using the gravitational waves, right? So my question would be, what do you think would be next in the new feature to discover with using the gravitational waves? Not only black holes that we hear about, but do you think there are other massive events or... Yeah, uh, well, let me say what the whole thing is a little bit first. Uh, Einstein in 1915 made a new theory of gravity. We learned gravity from Newton. Newton told us that when we jump up, the earth pulls us down and gave us a formula that the gravitational force goes inversely proportional to how far apart two objects are, how much they attract the moon to the earth, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, that was the most successful theory of all time by Newton. It lasted more than 200 years. Yeah. Einstein made a new theory of gravity, which is not really mean, it doesn't really mean that Newton's theory is wrong. It just means what happens in physics, all theories are basically an approximation of nature. And then we find places in nature where it doesn't quite apply right. And in this case, at very high velocities or very big masses, uh, you, it doesn't really apply. And that's why uh, Einstein developed a new theory of gravity where 
especially for astronomy, it's very important. But it had a characteristic. That characteristic you've heard of, and that is a warpage. The words that are used as a warpage of space and time. What that means is that a straight line is not really a straight line, and the distance from me to you isn't always the same between us because it's affected by the presence of any massive object, gravity. Gravity affects space and space becomes warped. We're lucky that somehow nature chose to make that a very, very tiny effect. You can imagine that if somehow warpage of space time was big enough, uh, it would change everything for us. But the effect is so small that it was incredibly difficult to find a way to test it. We, we had an analogy, which is in electricity. In electricity, we had two subjects, electricity and magnetism. And in the uh, 1800s, those became unified. We figured out that you can make magnets out of electricity and they're connected and we call it electromagnetism now. We have one book when we teach it. And that was discovered in the uh, 1800s or so. 1880s, 1800s, and now we are doing the same thing with gravity. And the theory of uh, electricity and magnetism unified much for us, but now with a theory of gravity, Einstein's equations became very important for, uh, for just forefront astronomy, but nothing practical for, for you and I. But there was one feature so Einstein's theory has been tested pretty well by astronomers, but there was one feature that was never tested, and that is that the, Einstein noticed that the equations that he wrote down for gravity look with different letters, look very much like the equations you have in electricity and magnetism. And being Einstein, he made the leap, and that is that if the equations look alike, even though they have different letters, there must be some effects in electricity and magnetism that also must, might apply to gravity. This is not with you know, detailed derivation, but just intuition. And he wrote a paper in 1915 pointing out that the equations look alike, so there must be gravitational waves. He said they would never be detected, but that's because he didn't really appreciate the advances of technology, maybe. Uh, that have happened, you know, but it took a hundred years to make enough advances in technology to make it uh, your alarms going. In your watch, is it possible? <laughs> I thought I reached my time. I thought I reached my time limiters. <laughs> so. Time is part of it. If, if you say there's a distortion of space. In Einstein's theory, it's actually mixed with time. It's space and time together. It's all mixed together, so the alarm is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, it turns out that uh, the uh, way that we try to measure it is to measure As I said, we're lucky that it's very small, but to see try to measure something that uh, basically the scheme that we used measures it for something that's violent, the collision of two black holes way in the universe. People haven't even seen black holes, but we uh, saw the destruction of two black holes. Form that no that go out, like, like light waves that come from electricity and magnetism, but they're just ripples in space itself. Ripples in space itself are a little bit like uh, the idea of going to a little pond and throwing a stone into the pond. The stone sinks to the bottom, but in the water you see these ripples move along, but there's only the water, there's nothing making them do it other than the initiation. So anyway, so the black holes collided. That was a big signal. We were able to see it by measuring the difference in two perpendicular directions at a particular time when it came through with an instrument that we call an interferometer. The most sensitive way we can measure things is to measure the difference of two, two measurements 
that should be equal. So you subtract one from the other and try to get zero. And we make an instrument that looks this way and this way. And we, it never sees, it, it just measures zero unless something happens. And it's capable of seeing a difference that is one one thousandth the size of a proton. A proton's pretty tiny. So <laughs> yeah. that's why it took so long. It took a long time to even try to do this. And then it took us 20 years to be able to test it. So we've seen black holes that, uh, and we've seen the collisions of other objects, neutron stars. I think the long range is gonna take a long time. This is a new and difficult subject. But I think the most interesting thing in my mind will be after probably all of our lifetimes, but it is the right tool to understand what really happened at the time of the Big Bang. Uh, right now, we, what we know about the Big Bang, other than ideas that you read about, is by looking at electromagnetic radiation, what are called photons. But in the early universe, there were so many particles that it was opaque. It's like using, you know, looking at something and then you look at it and you can't see any further. And the earliest time that we can look at by present techniques is 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, that's a long time after the Big Bang because a lot happened at the beginning of the Big Bang, including the fact that no one, not myself or anyone else, can tell you why we're here. Because if we go to CERN and knock particles together, we make number of particles and antiparticles. If that were true in detail at the, in the early universe when particles were made, they would have annihilated each other and there wouldn't have been any planets, stars, us, because somehow there was an excess of particles over antiparticles, so we're made out of matter. But we don't know why and we can't probe back to that. Gravitational waves are ideally the right way to do it because it can go, you can penetrate without this cloud that comes up for electromagnetic waves back to the very, very earliest time. So we all wonder what the Big Bang was. And I would say the ultimate experiment is to understand the early universe with gravitational waves. The right tool, we don't know how to do it because we can barely look at the present time. But given time, I think that's the way it should go. <laughs> Do you have a question on the Big Bang and, of course, the origin of life? You know, how life started. And, and unfortunately, we cannot mimic it in any experimental system. So this is a big question. But at least we can divide it into stages. So the first stage is fixation of nitrogen, how amino acids were generated. And what was the first molecule to be generated? Either it's RNA, and people now believe that actually RNA was the, the, the molecule from which DNA, you know, kind of evolved and then proteins and evolved, but we still don't know. So oxygen, uh, nitrogen fixation, this was the first one, and then generation of amino acids and, and, and nucleotides, and then generation of real life. And real life means membrane. You know, you know what separates us from non-living whatever are membranes. So bacteria have one membrane only because they don't have a nucleus. So this is, should be the first organism. And then, this, well, viruses are even below, but viruses need cells in order to replicate. And, and, and then eukaryotic cells or high cells that have two membranes. They have one membrane that separates them from the outside and an internal many organelles that separate them from the cytosol. Let it be the mitochondria, the lysosome, the peroxisome, but mostly the nucleus that separate the genetic material from the rest. So we are looking at stage-wise, and unfortunately, we cannot even mimic the first stage. We cannot mim even mimic the first stage. We cannot generate, you know, the beginning of amino acids um, and, and their combination into the beginning of proteins under any, you know, heating condition, pressure, whatever. Not to say how membranes organize and we need the membrane because th this is the essence of life. If people are asking me what life, not the question that Schrodinger tried to answer, but another, life is cascades. It's cascade of ions. We are, keeping, we are keeping difference. I'm not talking about temperature. Our body temperature is, of course, always constant and very different from the environmental. 
but, but, iron, but, but cascades of ion. So we have very low potassium outside, very high potassium inside, and the opposite for, for sodium. Very high sodium outside, very low sodium inside, and we have to have a pump that will use energy all the time. Therefore, we need membrane in order to, to keep cascades. And once we are dying, the cascade equalized across the two sides of the membrane. The action potential, the, the way that the nervous system working is about, you know, flow opening all of a sudden gates for flow of ion. So it's again the membrane potential. That's the essence of life. And once we are dying, that's all flattened out. But we are far, far away from um, regenerating it or, 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 or faithfully mimicking it under any laboratory condition. So I love it because we have gone from the very specific to the creation of universal life. <laughs> this, is, this is fantastic. So Another interesting fact, since you talked about life, is the black holes that we saw collide happened 1.5 billion years ago. So if we reflect on 1.5 billion years ago, we were just evolving from single cell to multi-cell life here mm -hmm. on Earth when this collision actually happened mm -hmm. that we detected 10 years ago, five years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, very <laughs> interesting. So I don't know if somebody in the, in the, among the public wants to ask questions. I think that one uh, <laughs> needs to be recorded, Juan. <laughs> Yes, I am from this field. I am a professor of physics here. Uh, you talked before about the, the science is about uh, solving problems. And in fact, I, I, I have many people I admire in, in this way. But now, science now has become a lot about uh, publishing papers and making uh, projects. And, and uh, it, it's more like opportunistic, at least at the level I know. Because, uh, there's a goal to, to get funding and to, and to be on certain hot topics. So, uh, since so long time, I've been here, someone who has a real, uh, uh, the dream of solving some, some big topics. So, I would like to know your opinion about this, this evolution of science. Well, it's all bad, just like you said. <laughs> uh, I, think, uh, I think that in almost any occupation, anything we do in our lives, there's all kinds of obstacles. And those are obstacles, but I think the vision and the way you should try to approach things is more or less the way that I said, to try to be answering the basic problems in science that interest you and figuring out how to do it in a system that often has hurdles is part of life. We have that in anything in life. And if it happens for researchers, it's not surprising. It, I mean, there's real money involved, there's people involved. So the fact that there's systems that sometimes put up obstacles is just one of the problems that you have to solve. Do I have magic to how to solve it? No, I think you have to be clever, but if you're clever enough to do the science, I think you can try to work the system. What do you think about, about that question? <laughs> well, of course, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I don't think that we are even approaching answering questions in either of the you know, disciplines. I think, however, that biology and medicine are a little bit more opportunistic than physics. I think that the physicist, and Barry may correct me, wants to see kind of a holistic umbrella theory, you know, the Big Bang, you know, how things started. In biology, you pick up whatever, you know, you can work on viruses, or you can work on the bananas, or whatever, and then there are, of course, general principles, like the genetic you know, the central dogma of biology is still holding with, you know, with changes here and there, you know, from DNA to RNA to proteins. Now we have microRNA and we have all kinds of intermediate steps, but basically it's there. But as for the subject, it's very eclectic. And I think that at the end you start to see the building, you know, people are putting the window first, but then, and then they put the basement. Typically they should put the basement first, but no, in biology, it's, I think it's a little bit more eclectic. But, but, but again, you are following the same, you know, you're following very basic principles of energy, of course, physical principles, and of chemistry, of course. So there's no violation of the basic rules. That, that cannot be. But the, the selection of the subject is, is, is very opportunistic and eclectic. 
And, and so, but what do you think about, uh, one thing is to choose the subject and to change the subject based on the environment, but also what do you think is the, the, the role of financing that subject? How, how has it evolved in your, in your lifetime? Do, have you seen changing and being more demanding in terms of results? And... Actually, I think the governments and system are more generous than when I started mm -hmm. in terms of the fraction of money spent on, on scientific developments. Maybe because they've made a lot of progress because of investments in, mm -hmm. in science and technology. The fact that there's more rules and uh, other obstacles that the, have been put up is a, is a problem. But as I say, we're clever. We should be able to work around that as much as possible, change it. Uh, but actually, I think governments in general, probably it's true also in Spain, are much more generous than when I started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They should be yet more, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we always want more. But do you think that uh, that's, that that's the case, or do you see that it's not uh, so generous? No. <laughs> Financing is competitive, of course. I mean, you need to be... I think that in Europe we are all lucky, I mean. I mean, all including Spain, of course, that we have the EU, which is a very important tool to fund science, hopefully based only on quality, but also looking at the, at the needs of the society. So, you know, the EU in Brussels have several big problems, but they are divided into from basic science, but all the way to tackle problems, let's say uh, air pollution, uh, uh, climate change, things that are bothering the society, uh, um, at large. And I think that it's all in all, it's working. It's a, you know, with all the bureaucracy in Brussels, it's a very good organization. Um, each country takes, gives according to the GDP, but takes back according to the quality. So that's the meaning of competition. So Israel takes much more than it gives. Uh, it happens so. Uh, Germany complains that they give much more than they take. I don't know about Spain, but. Uh, yeah, it's all about um, a competition, but I think that it's a good organization. In the United States, they have their own tools. They have the NSF, they have the NIH uh, to fund either big project or individual scientists. Uh, but I think that, you know, we always complain. There is always a question that politicians are bothered by, and I don't think that scientists can give them a, how many scientists there should be. How, the graduate school, I'm not talking about PIs. How many biologists should we educate? Every university in Spain should have a faculty of biology and, and pour out every year 200 uh, bachelors, or, and, and, and the same in physics, and in chemistry, and in computer sciences. Or should we prioritize? Maybe computer science nowadays is more important. So we emphasize this. So there is no question. Everybody wants to be big. Everybody wants to be, you know, to, be, to lead. Everybody wants to be first. And, and, but I think that the question of quantity is, is always there, is always there. And it's more complicated by the fact that you don't know, let's say that you have 100 bachelors in biology, you don't know how many of them will make it to the top. So how many you need in order to, to move into the next generation? Because what, if you look at science in a big way, it's layers, right? You know, we are generating tons of knowledge. Most of it is completely useless. You know, people don't, you know, things are not cited or cited marginally, but only little, is kind of distilled to the next generation. So the question is how much we need in order to secure the distillation in such an amount that we'll be able to feed the next questions. It's not the next people, the next question in order to solve it. And this is very complicated to calculate and, and nobody knows. So meanwhile, I believe that there is a lot of waste of money. That's my belief, but nobody will dare to, you know, people, you know, politicians, cut it and they put it, and I think that there is kind of numbers that how much country put into GDP. So Korea and Israel are leading. Israel is a mistake. And I'll explain you in a minute why. Around 5% is going into R&D. But in Israel, a lot is going into security. So, and, and it's mixed. The government will always hide how much go to civilian development and how much going to develop missiles. So you, you never know. Korea, 
is the same problem because they are afraid of the North Korean. So they also put a lot of into security. It's also around 5%. Very, you know, countries that are really lagging behind. You're looking at Africa, for example, or even some European, East, old East Europe. It can come to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3%. And average countries are about 2 to 3%. So that's, the, that's our, about the numbers. Uh, but again, how much to do? I cannot tell you. I don't know. Sorry, that's a difficult question because I guess you need to seed a lot in order to be able to get something that is uh, fruitful. But and, and that how much seeding is the problem? I think is right to to understand. But uh, any more questions? Yeah, can you raise that? Gonna a bit with that. With in a world like that, our present world, in which we have, well, I'm Francisco Fabregat from the physics department. Also, in a in a world in which uh, we have fake news, we have more impact than good signs. For instance, now people saying that the the, the Earth is plain uh, have more impact than one good paper or Nature, or maybe it's more cited than than other things. How can you think we can fight against that? Because at the end, all these things undermine our credibility and the excuse for politicians to cut our, our resources. How do you think we can, we can fight this more effectively? Well, uh, I don't have a magic formula. I think we all know that the, one of the most important things in life, not just in science, is to share with the population in general. We're a very elite and small part of the population. Uh, we're doing much better than when I was young at sharing what science discovers with the public, with the children, and so forth. But we could do much better than we do. Somehow, the fact that uh, science is exciting to us, the problems are exciting, that's information that should be shared, and, and uh, people then can appreciate more what's done by scientists and technicians and technical fields. I think that's the only way is is knowledge. We also have a problem that we're very separated from politics, which I think is a difficulty. In, in my country, there's one PhD scientist in all of Congress. And, and, and there's mostly our lawyers and businessmen. They make decisions every day. Forget ones that are maybe are controversial for other reasons, but ones every day that have technological components and they don't have the skill to do it. And including giving money for science. So the fact that we have governments that are not run in any sense by a proportion of scientists is even worse than the fact that we have gender problems in our own uh, fields. So I think we have to participate more in government and we have to do a much better job at sharing what we do with the, with the public and especially the young people than, than we do. We, capture, we have good science museums, we know how to do it but we don't, most of us are too selfish. We don't spend our time uh, doing that. I think we have to if we want to solve those problems. Yeah, the problem of the IV tower and we all being withdrawn, I think that that has changed, don't you think, Your through time. the last decades that uh, our role as, as disseminators of that information at a level, like the, the way you did before for all of us, uh, that has, that's change a little bit. The way it's changed a lot, and we just have to do even, even better. Even better, yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me add one other thing which hasn't come up, which is that I think uh, we should appreciate the fact that uh, although countries and uh, governments have borders, science really is totally international. We work on the same problems in the U.S. We do, we're in different fields, but we work on the same problems in physics that are worked on in Spain, in Israel, in, in Russia, wherever, the, it's politics that are forming borders. You know, for much of science, then cooperating across countries and being more international is a, a very important key to uh, being able to advance in science because we can use the resources much more to advance the science than competing or duplicating where science is expensive, like in my field. So having uh, international laboratories like CERN, 
which is uh, has countries, not not just European countries now, mm -hmm. that are sharing to do a very expensive kind of research, uh, is a model for what can be done. Our experiment, which is was created in the U.S., created by us, has uh, 21 countries uh, participating mm -hmm. in in the research at that at that level, and I think we should both appreciate and work in every way we can to share our science. We, of course, share it in terms of open access journals and so forth, but uh, even that has financial problems that uh -huh. how you have journals that are fine for Spain, Israel, and the US, but how we bring the developing world scientists in it has a financial problem of how you distribute and support the journals and so forth. And we have to somehow solve those problems so that the whole world has access to becoming scientists and doing science and appreciating science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that that last point is very important and is very in the, in the spot right now. The, the fact that we should find a way of uh, spreading the information in, in not such a commercial uh, directed way or in a more open, more, more being able to share with other people and, and to have a, a central system, not these atomized uh, systems of publication. And yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I think that's a really central aspect of our business, collective business in here. <laughs> so, any more questions? Because we are getting close to, to ending, but we still have some minutes. Luis, I think, wanted to ask you something related to the last topic. Yeah, uh, good morning. I, my name is Luis Martinez. I'm the responsible for the unit for uh, scientific dissemination. And related to the last question, I wanted to know your vision about if the scientific community is aware of the need of this dialogue between society, between the world of science and the rest of society. Do you think that we, as part of the scientific community or the institutions should have a role in uh, that dialogue in citizen science and so on? Yeah, I, I think uh, maybe individually we're aware of it a little bit in terms of organizations like professional societies, but professional societies are still more focused on internal issues of kind of how science is uh, done, giving awards, all those kind of things. Uh, it, it, I think the scientific societies could do a lot more to help uh, solve the problems of how science and engineering and technology should be supported both by governments, how the education system should work better and so forth. So I think uh, kind of on all levels, we have to do better at, at that. I think this, this is a scream that is uh, out loud, but we still have to grab it and, and put it down and, and, and know how to do it. We are still grappling with, the, but, <laughs> with those but I, questions. As I said, I think uh, I've been doing science for long enough. It's much better now than yeah. it was. Everything that we said almost, inter how international it is compared mm -hmm. to when I started uh, is just much different but we have problems there just because there's government problems, but there's also competition and all kinds of things that get mm -hmm. in the way. But I just want to, one last comment about sharing mm -hmm. that is very important. You know, in physics, it's, you know, there's a big problems and mostly on basic knowledge. In biology, it, sharing has become a problem that really impedes progress in the way, because universities are very much concerned about IP. Mm -hmm. If I have a new drug with no effect, you know, until it's patented and everything, all the lawyers and everything is settled, you cannot talk about it, you cannot present it, you cannot do anything. And even then, it's presented under, you know, a code name with no structure and, and so on and so forth. And think about the competition that we saw in big between the companies that developed the COVID-19, you know, between Moderna and Pfizer. At the end, they both made it. But in Israel, for example, Israel served as the biggest laboratory for Pfizer. We bought only Pfizer. And we had a central follow-up of all the population, and we knew exactly, and we reported it to Pfizer. Therefore, they gave us priority so in, in getting the vaccines over countries that may have needed it even more. 
So you see there is an ethical issue here and moral issues here, and the government is going only for one company, not for bidding for maybe the cheapest. You know, so there are many issues here about information that somehow impedes progress and it's becoming worse in that sense, especially in the drug development, because this is a big market. We are talking, if you are reading about purchasing in the, in the market of drugs, you know, there, I, I haven't seen a company that was purchased for less than $10 billion. That's the cheapest you can buy. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a huge market and companies are very, and they buy a lot of the IP from universities. So we get special instruction from the IP authority, don't talk about it and so and don't present it and don't do this and don't do that until everything is rectified legally, which might take always time. So sharing that has been for years for the fundamental value of the international language of science, and we always regard science as an international language that everybody can walk in, communicate, understand, has nevertheless built internal walls. So we shouldn't be naive about it. Mm -hmm. So I guess we are going to end up with the feeling that things are better. <laughs> but there are still many things that need to improve. And we have, a, we have to have an active and thoughtful role into, into that improvement. So we shouldn't sleep on it and let it, let it go and be self-satisfied. But I think we should be positive that things are are getting better and, and, and not focus only on the on the problems and the hurdles, as you said, but also on the on the positive nature of our profession that I think is the is the best one in the world. So many thanks, and I want to finish thanking uh, Professor Aaron and Professor Barry for being with us, for sharing all their knowledge, all their feelings, all their emotions about science, and also to the foundation. Uh, Fundació uh, Premis Rey, uh, Rey Jaume I for giving us the opportunity to have these two magnificent figures in our field and thank you for a fun experience and, and thank you all for coming.